From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Anne-Marie Hordur. Not guilty on all counts is the plea. Former President Trump arrested and appearing today at a Miami federal court to answer charges brought by special counsel Jack Smith. It was an historic day, the first time a president, former or current, arraigned on federal criminal charges. President here stopping by a Cuban restaurant in Miami along the way to speak with supporters just after he left the courthouse. I think it's going great. I think it's a rigged deal here. We have a rigged country. We have a country that's corrupt. We have a country that's got no borders. We have a country that's got nothing but problems. We're a nation in decline. And then they do this stuff. And Trump set to speak tonight from Bedminster, New Jersey. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle offering their thoughts on the charges. We need to look systemically at how administrations handle classified documents. Um, we've seen them now in a garage by a Corvette. We've seen them in a beach house in Rehoboth. It's just further evidence of the, you know, of, of the cult of Trump in the Republican Party. The supporters, protesters, and others braving the Florida heat. We'll look at what happens next, the political ramifications, and a lot more over the course of this next hour. Anne-Marie, quite a, quite a moment today. Not a surprise to see not guilty pleas uh, by Donald Trump, but still an historic day to see a former or current president charged, taken into custody and charged on the federal level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what was more stunning is when he left, he decided to stop at this local Cuban restaurant yeah. and made it an absolute campaign stop. The crowd loved him, taking photos. He gave a little bit of a preview what he plans to say this evening That's right. at Bedminster. Um, and in, in that case, he became the nominee, That's really. Right. Well, and, we'll see about that. Uh, well, well, you know, that <laughs> this looked like a campaign stop to well, me. Well, it certainly did. He looked like uh, a candidate running for, for re-election, for sure. And now everyone's going to play that soundbite outside yes. of the Cub Cuban Classic cafe Trump and not here. the courthouse. Classic Trump. And I'm sure our panel will want to weigh in on this. Joining us now uh, from Miami is Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons. I don't know if you got an invite to Versailles, uh, where the president <laughs> went today, uh, Kaylee. But pretty interesting to see the president turning this into a campaign style event, knowing that he's got a fundraiser set for later today. What was it like outside the courthouse? Well, it was busy all day here today, Joe. Of course, there was a lot of media representatives like myself, but also hundreds of pro-Trump supporters uh, that did show out in, in support of the former president. Not the thousands that Miami authorities had been braced for, and uh, police that I talked to said that there had been no incidents of violence that they were aware of. Now, some of those supporters, after President Trump was leaving the courthouse following the arraignment and that not guilty plea on those 37 counts, were chanting things like we love Trump and USA as they watched the motorcade leave. Really felt like a positive uh, atmosphere. So perhaps President Trump treating this uh, like a campaign day, knowing that he was having supporters uh, that were going to be here today. Now, of course, as you both discussed, he is going to be head back to New Jersey this evening to speak at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time. Likely will echo some of the same messaging we have heard from him. And frankly, what I was hearing from Trump supporters here today, the ideas of injustice, of the weaponization uh, of the Justice Department. There were a lot of people wag waving flags as well, saying Trump won in 2020. You know it and I know it. So definitely uh, the polarization of the politics uh, around this certainly on display here in Miami today. And of course, this is really just the first step in these legal proceedings. He has been arraigned, yes, but now this case will move from Miami to West Palm Beach, will be overseen by a Trump appointee, Judge uh, Aileen Cannon. And this could drag out for quite some time, as we all understand, could go up to November 2024 or even beyond. Bloomberg's Kay Lyons, thank you so much. Bracing the heat all day in Miami. Joining us now around the table, Bloomberg White House Deputy Editor Mike Dorning and Washington Bureau Senior Editor Wendy Benjaminson. Wendy, let's start with you. Today, huge fanfare, a big show, but actually the substance is what comes next. Exactly. What, what does come next? Well, next, he, he will have time, presumably, to prepare his defense. The prosecutors will have time to prepare their case. No trial date was set today. Today was just the sort of intro where he was fingerprinted. They didn't mugshot him, Marshall said, because everybody already knows what he looks like. He was <laughs> That's given... For sure. He was um, not 
made to pay any bail. As you saw, he was free to go to a restaurant afterwards and is on his way back to New Jersey. They don't consider him a flight risk. So now it's all just sort of goes into sort of stasis for a few weeks at least until we have some more trial development. It's important to note that we do not have a trial date. We were kind of hoping that we would get that information, Mike. With that said, we do have a Trump legal team, or will, uh, that will do everything it can to delay this case. That's been Donald Trump's specialty over the years. Can we now assume then that this story is going to last the duration of the campaign cycle? It seems likely. Based on what we've heard so far, there's a good chance that they can delay it, maybe even beyond the November 2024 election. It's hard to tell exactly how long it will take, but mm -hmm. it can take quite a while. That said, at, when you have this going on, the other trials going on, there's going to be more and more stuff that's going to be coming out that's potentially damaging to Trump with independent voters, right. even if not with the Republican base. If this goes past the November election, doesn't it become much easier for the other candidates that want to be the Republican nominee to not attack him, but just say he's drowning in legal work? He does not have the capacity and the time to be their commander in chief. Well, I also think the biggest risk is as you get closer to the nomination, Republicans will want to win the election. So they can make the case that Trump is damaged by this indictment. And as people start thinking about it, there may be someone that can actually challenge him and say, hey, I could do better against Biden than you can. But as this comes out, even though the Republicans are rallying around him now, if they perceive him to be a risk in the election, could be a problem. You know, Emory brings us back to 2016 because that was the refrain Donald Trump used on Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. You remember this, Wendy, the yes. compromise candidate. Exactly. You might agree with her on everything, but she's not going to be viable as she's tied up in federal court. That's right. him and now. And how dare she be loose with the nation's secrets? Well, uh, yes, that's a whole other, I guess, <laughs> conversation. We've been hearing a lot about Hillary Clinton, yeah. but can't his own words be used against him? Absolutely. They were used against him in the indictment itself. The mm. indictment quotes him from 2016 campaign speeches <laughs> saying that Hillary Clinton was played loose with classified documents. And one of the things that the Republican talking points, I think, are missing here and his supporters are missing is that y these aren't apples to apples cases. Yes, Hillary Clinton mishandled classified documents, apparently. Joe Biden had some in his garage, mm -hmm. and et cetera. Trump was waving around top secret SCI, which is secure compartmentalized information, yes. the highest classification level. He was waving them around to a writer and publisher, and he's caught on tape doing so, saying, I should have declassified this when I was president, but I didn't, and now I can't. It's, it's so much different than simply holding them in your garage and then saying, come get them to the FBI when they want them. Yeah, it's actually the content of those documents. Exactly right. Um, what we're, a lot of legal experts are also talking about is the fact that there's a lot in this indictment, but that they likely have much more. So this case could be, in Bill Barr's words, his own attorney general, already damning. He said if even half of what's in the indictment is true he'd be toast. But there could potentially be more. There could potentially be more. And they've already decided, I think, in the interest of trying to keep a lid on this simmering cauldron that American politics is right now, they didn't charge him for any of the documents that he returned. They decided not to charge him with that, and they avoided charges that could result in disqualification from office. So that is a way of sort of tamping down some of the political outrage. So they've given him already some deference. And yes, we don't really, the indictment is an outline. We don't really know the full extent of mm -hmm. this. We heard from a number of lawmakers over the course of the day, as Mike uh, Dorning mentioned uh, earlier. It was largely Republicans making noise, but we heard from Democrats as well. Let's hear uh, from the sound today on Capitol Hill. As we all know, in America, nobody is above the law, not even a former president. And I think that uh, the American people, regardless of where they stand on Donald Trump, former President Trump, uh, should allow the process uh, to play out through the court system in a peaceful manner. I hear a lot of people who are concerned uh, in my district about how the D Department of Justice is operating, something I continue to track. I can tell you that with respect to my Republican colleagues, their reaction is absolutely not the reaction it would have been if this were Hillary Clinton or anybody else. Here's my prediction about the presidential race. The experts will be wrong. They always are. <laughs> 
<laughs> we could, of course, listen to John Kennedy all day, uh, the senator from Louisiana. But with that said, uh, Mike, you mentioned that, that there could be a breaking point here mm -hmm. because it was very predictable what we heard today along party lines. And, and, and once we were in the throes of this campaign, will Donald Trump continue to, to, to have the loyalty test here with House Republicans like we saw today? I think it's likely for a long time with House Republicans whose districts are almost overwhelmingly gerrymandered so that their only real threat is a primary challenger, that he will continue to see loyalty from most of them as long as he has loyalty within the Republican Party. What you did see is some of the Republican presidential candidates, Chris Christie very bluntly doing this, but others sort of very delicately saying, hey, like Nikki Haley said, this is inexcusable behavior, although she said, hey, it's politically motivated. Sure. Tim Scott, you know, serious allegations, um, although he also was arguing it's politically motivated. But it's a, it's a tentative way of trying to test this argument that, hey, I hate to say it, it's disqualifying. I don't mean to offend any of you Trump voters, but yeah, maybe right. you could do better with me. Walking on <laughs> yeah. yeah. How true. That's quite uh, the dance, isn't it? Many thanks uh, to our great panel for getting us started. Bloomberg's Mike Dorning and Wendy Benjaminson with us from our Washington bureau. Coming up, we'll get insights on former President Trump's potential defense strategy. For that, we turn to Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, with some fascinating in insights ahead. That's next on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. With a look now closely at the case against former President Trump, we've been through the politics. Let's get to the legal side here. We bring in Palm Beach State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg. Dave, you've been a reliable voice here through the course of now two indictments. And I do want to note for our viewers that you predicted the venue for this case. It's going to uh, Palm Beach County, West Palm Beach. And I wonder if you see that as good or bad news for the former president. I think it's good news for prosecutors. Uh, it's mixed news for the former president. It makes it easier to go to court. He lives right near the courthouse. But if he had to drive down to Miami, that would be quite an ordeal. It's also easier for the judges, or the judge, excuse me, prosecutors, everyone involved, because Miami is a very uh, long way away from West Palm Beach, from Fort Pierce. So that's good news. Now, mm -hmm. where it could be good for prosecutors, I think, is that Palm Beach County is bluer than Dade County. Dade County went for Trump by 46% of the vote. Palm Beach County went for him by 43% of the vote. Also, it's very hard to convict a public official in Miami-Dade County. There's a long history of public officials acting badly who get acquitted, not here in Palm Beach County. So I think that's a win for prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Um, when you look at his still legal troubles, um, Dave, what is going on in terms of, you know, you know all the top lawyers in Florida, the former president is still scrambling to get top legal counsel. Uh, what are you hearing? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised by it, Emory. He continues to undermine his attorneys. Remember, Carla Tour, he recently left. One reason why he left was because he had sent a letter to Congress that said that Trump did not pack the boxes. His hands are clean. And then Trump, shortly after, at his town hall meeting, said, I packed the boxes. I did it. It's, it's hmm. clients like that will make you pull your hair out. And you have turf wars within the legal team. Boris Epstein, a, an attorney who is like the consigliere there, has never tried a case before, but he runs the show. And so it's not a pleasant place to be. And then you have a client who's criticizing prosecutors and judges in other states, but he likes this judge locally. But it's very hard when mm -hmm. you have an out-of-control client who doesn't listen to what you say. This is going to be an interesting element uh, of the story to watch unfold. Dave, I want to ask you about the crime fraud exception. This is a very important part of the case 
that people should understand as we move forward here and we prepare for Donald Trump's legal team, whatever form it may take, uh, to, to attempt to discredit this indictment. This is the exception that allowed prosecutors to use notes from Donald Trump's former lawyer, Evan Corcoran, as part of the case, moving beyond attorney-client privilege. And I'm sure you can explain this to us, as uh, the former president was alleged to have furthered his crimes using his representation. Without those notes, though, this is not as strong of an indictment. Will we see the Trump team try to have that stripped out of this case? They will definitely try, but they will fail because this issue has been litigated through the D.C. courts. So what happened here is that you've got attorney-client privilege, which was pierced by the fact that Trump used his lawyer to try to facilitate a crime, namely the crime of obstruction, namely violations of the Espionage Act. Can't do that. And that's mm -hmm. how the Department of Justice was given access to Evan Corcoran's notes. And not just any notes. Evan Corcoran was like a novelist. He took down all these yeah. meticulous notes about everything he did and where he was, you know, because he was acting under the legal theory of CYA. He did not want to be convicted himself of obstruction. <laughs> and so he was covering himself. And so that is come back to haunt Trump. It's a treasure trove of information for prosecutors, and Trump is going to challenge that uh, in the court here in the Southern District of Florida. But it's already been decided. But what Trump is also going to try to do is delay matters. So he's going to fight this here, everything mm -hmm. he can do to delay this case past the 2024 election. Um, Dave, when you also look at his makeup of his lawyers, there's a lot of reporting that he's struggling to find an individual that is very well advanced in terms of the national security apparatus. Do you think there needs to be a lawyer on his team who actually has that clearance level so they can handle these documents, given how sensitive these documents were in this indictment? Yes, they can gain the clearance level. The lawyers can gain that. But the tougher part is gaining the experience in this uh, very specialized area of the law to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jay Bratt, who's the head of counterintelligence for the DOJ, or Jack Smith, who's a pit bull. So it's one thing to have criminal defense lawyers on your side. I mean, he's got Christopher Kies, who's very well respected, former Solicitor General of Florida, but he doesn't listen to Christopher Kies. He sent him to the sidelines, uh, and he's got other people, but none of them has uh, national security credentials. And that's going to be tough because you're dealing with a lot of experience on the government side. Oh, you certainly are. All right, Dave Arenberg, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm sure we'll be checking in with you uh, well through 2024. State attorney for Palm Beach County, of course, in Florida. Coming up in the program, U.S. inflation slowing in the month of May as investors look ahead to the Fed's upcoming meeting. That conversation up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. What's the Fed going to do? They've got to balance their concern about tamping down inflation. We've made progress, but we got more to go with the fragility in our banking system. And I don't know what they're going to do. Every time that inflation goes up, that's less money in people's um, in people's pocketbooks. But I think that the things that are driving um, inflation, it's hard for me to see specifically how higher rates are going to affect that. Lawmakers there weighing in on Fed Chair Jay Powell's next move amid signs that deceleration, inflation and cooling economic outlook could create room for a rate pause. Joining us now is Bloomberg U.S. Treasury reporter Victoria Drendrinu. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us. A lot time. happening in this space, even though the political world, all eyes are on, on Trump. But we had inflation today, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the Hill, and then, of course, tomorrow the decision from the Fed. So inflation at the moment, this was a very positive number for the administration. Yeah, exactly. Hasn't been this low since March of 2021. No, as you said, it hasn't, and it's a good number. It's kind of in line with expectations, but it's good because it kind of gives the Fed breathing room and some space tomorrow, which, you know, they're very likely to pause. That's what's expected, and it gives them time to, you know, look at the numbers, wait to see what comes next month, and then reassess whether another hike is needed. So we were talking yesterday about the hawkish 
uh, pause or the hawkish skip, skip, right, knowing that there'd be another one coming. What form does that take? Is, is Jay Powell going to announce the decision and then come out and like blow everyone's mind in the news conference and yell at the reporters and scare the market into knowing that there's another hike coming? What qualifies as hawkish? Is it a change in the statement that comes out after? I think I think it's going to be nuanced, particularly with these numbers, which are which kind of speak for themselves. So I think you know we're going to be looking for changes in the wording, changes in what he says. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like I think for them, it's really important to wait to see what comes up in July um, in the next CPI, and uh, that's going to be kind of a bigger determinant of what happens. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of tension, right, between Jay Powell at the moment and his staff in terms of projections, because a lot of the times the Fed will say something in their projections. But he will come out and try to walk a finer line. He's not trying to scare everyone, is he? No, I don't think he is. I think he also has like a tricky balancing act because everyone is looking at the Fed to see what's going to happen with rate heights, how is that going to affect the economy. So I think, you know, in his role, like communication is really important um, as opposed to, you know, forecast, which is a more academic, you know, data exercise. So I think, you know, what really matters to market participants is what he's going to say. So that's what they'd be looking out for. We heard from Abby Joseph Cohen uh, earlier today on Bloomberg from Columbia University, spoke on Bloomberg surveillance about what to expect. Let's listen. Inflation is coming down. It takes pressure off of the Fed to continue to raise interest rates. They have already done so much. We already have an inverted yield curve. If I were voting, which I'm not, but if I were a voting member of the FOMC, I would vote for wait and watch. The market seems to be speaking that same language as well. Will it be a shock uh, if something different happens at the next meeting? In other words, if there's no hike, does that mean things were worse than we thought? You mean in July? Yeah. Well, I think whether it's going to be a shock or not depends on the inflation numbers that we're going to see before that. So I think that's what... We'll be telegraphing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what what we're looking at. That's what the market's looking at. That's what the Fed's going to be looking at. So, you know, I think it's too soon to tell whether it's going to be a shock. At least the numbers today, you know, could spell out more, like a longer pause potentially, but it's hard to tell yet. But just for for the upcoming meeting... I think a pause is highly anticipated. We have to remember, this is a stock market that's been betting on rate cuts later on this year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, It's kind of crazy when Mm -hmm. you look at what potentially look back at the directory of what the Fed has been doing. Quickly, today we had the Treasury Secretary on the Hill. She was asked about everything. Yeah. Inflation, China, Russia. Mm-hmm. What was what were the biggest takeaways from the Treasury Secretary? I mean, yeah, she briefly touched upon inflation, which, you know, she still says is the top priority for the administration, for the Fed, obviously. I think, you know, she was asked a lot about China, which especially now that we're past the debt ceiling stress is very front of mind for the administration. She kind of insisted that, you know, um, it should be de-risking and not decoupling and kind of echoing the administration's focus on re-establishing some kind of relationship with China um, while being mindful of national security. We'll find out tomorrow. Special coverage yeah. when that Fed announcement is made here starting at 1.30 p.m. Wall Street time. Many thanks to Bloomberg's Victoria Dendrinu for the help on that. Coming up, more on the charges against former President Donald Trump as we look inside the case. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. We focus now on the evidence in the Trump case, what it tells us as well about the laws surrounding national security documents and a true expert, someone who spent a career dealing with documents like these. That would be William Cohen, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense and founder, chairman and CEO of the Cohen Group. Mr. Secretary, welcome back to Bloomberg. It's good to see you here. I just want to start with the basics here now that we have a chance to speak with you. We saw history made today in Miami with the former president of the United States charged uh, with a federal crime. Obviously, this indictment is making an enormous amount of news. There's a very political aspect to this as Republicans and Democrats argue over it. But for someone who held your post in the Pentagon, for instance, do you think the charges are worth making history? Absolutely. I think it was, well, it's a bad day for Mr. Trump. It was a very good day for the American people uh, in the sense that it was a reaffirmation of the belief that we hold that no person is above the law, including the former president of the United States. I had the privilege of serving 
uh, some 10 years on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Barry Goldwater, the conscience of the conservatives, asked me to serve on the <laughs> Intel Committee, and I did so as, as the um, uh, vice chairman of, of that committee for half of that time, and then over at the Pentagon. And I can tell you there is not a day that went by that I didn't hold documents and look at them and understand how much it was costing in terms of Treasury to collect the information, how many people mm -hmm. were putting their lives on the line to collect it, how many men and women who were serving on the front lines as far as the military is concerned were in jeopardy if that information were to get into hands that were not supposed to have it. So it's a, uh, it's a sacred duty, and that's what makes this such a terrible crime if, in fact, the facts uh, uh, are verified. Uh, that you put in danger the security of the American people, knowingly yeah. uh, holding on to this information. So it was secret, top secret, top secret, uh, compartmentalized, uh, namely um, right. uh, the very highest of, of, of security. So that's what's involved, and that's why um, the president, former president, was is being held accountable. Did you ever take any of those documents home? No, uh, I never did. Uh, I would be briefed every morning once I entered the official limousine and driving from my apartment over to the Pentagon. It took about six minutes to get there. I was given a, uh, the PDB, uh, uh, the president's daily brief, PDB. Uh, I scanned it quickly, mm -hmm. saw what I needed to see, and then if I needed questions, I would I'd leave the briefing book and have someone bring it up to uh, my office at the Pentagon. But I tried not to hold on to anything for uh, any period of time and always have someone with me to make sure that it was uh, always returned. Mr. Secretary, some of the markings on these documents showed that they should only be shared with U.S. allies, part of the so-called Five Eyes, this intel community. Right. How concerning is it for U.S. allies that this information that they thought was shared just between them and the United States or them and another partnership could potentially have gotten right. into the wrong hands? Well, it calls into question our credibility in terms of protecting the information. It also calls into question their security. To the extent they have gathered information that we don't have and have shared that with us from sources that are uh, confidential to them and secret to them, but they've shared that with us, and now uh, if they fear that we don't have a procedure in place or don't have people and a president in place who will revere those documents and protect them at all costs, then they're unlikely to share them with us in the future. And that's one of the fears that uh, many of the uh, countries that I've spoken with recently, they fear that we would have a return to uh, the White House of the former president and he would act just as cavalierly and just as uh, uh, recklessly as he did in handling these in the future. So they might be very very unwilling to provide information to us that might compromise our own security. So is there something that allies would want to see in place in case there was a return of the former president to the White House so they can feel that the information they are providing U.S. institutions stay in the proper hands and is classified and protected in the appropriate manner? They have to be satisfied that we have people in positions of power and influence who are credible, reliable, honest, uh, and are dedicated to the public uh, interest and the public trust. Uh, and we also have to have a process in place. The notion that any president could simply wave his hand or telepathically disclose the information uh, in, in, in his hands and thereby jeopardize the lives of people who are depending upon him to keep those secrets, mm -hmm. well, that calls into question the viability of the United States as the leader of the free world that has an umbrella to protect our allies as well as the American people. So, yeah, they have a real problem in terms of if we don't have the people that are trustworthy, if we don't have the process that's reliable and protective, then they may not share that with us, and that puts us and them at a very uh, dangerous position. I want to tap your firsthand experience a bit more here, Mr. Secretary, as we've seen images of some of these documents, for instance, those that were splayed on the floor at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, our viewers have seen the same photographs uh, with documents that are labeled SCI, Sensitive Compartmented Information. We've seen labels like Talent right. Keyhole. Can, can you connect the dots for us? on what these types of documents might include. We've heard uh, talk of nuclear plans, about battle plans, for instance, that the former president may have been retaining or even sharing. 
Well, uh, obviously the Pentagon uh, is engaged in war planning or planning for wars that might erupt at any moment. Yeah. They constantly have to go through this process. The notion that that would be shared with the president of the United States is not unusual. He's the commander in chief. And so. And that would be labeled as CI. It would be top secret, yes. Uh, and uh, you get into more specifics in terms of uh, uh, analyzing uh, what we ha know in the way of countries who are producing biological weapons, uh, who are engaged in uh, cyber activities, uh, who are doing profiles on uh, individuals, uh, and what that mm -hmm. means for our security. So there are so many different layers and levels, but ultimately the commander in chief has to be someone who treats these with reverence to say people's lives are at stake. I am elected to protect and defend the Constitution and the lives of the American people and those of our allies. And when you drop that standard and say, I can do whatever I want to with this. I don't need a process. I can wave my hand. I can declassify it immediately without asking anybody. When you say that yeah. uh, to the world, it certainly calls into question why they should share anything with us. Secretary, when you read the reporting and you read the indictment itself, what do you find the most troubling to national security off of these documents? Uh, what's most troublesome is that uh, the president had them, the former president, that he was notified he shouldn't have them, that he refused to turn them over, and then he played a game of uh, hide and lie. Hide the documents, and then if you'll lie for me, that will be even better. If you'll uh, pull those documents out, that will be even better. Perhaps if we had no documents at all. So ba very clearly to me, at least, he's engaged in obstructing justice. He's uh, engaged in a conspiracy with his aide to help him hide the information and even encourage one of his lawyers to lie on his behalf. So that's what is so discouraging that he has no reverence for these, this information. Uh, he, um, at, at the day after he fired Jim Comey, he had a meeting in his office in the White House with the um, foreign minister of Russia, uh, Lavrov, and the Russian um, uh, ambassador. Uh, uh, Kisiliak, and, and uh, Kislyak, rather. And what did he do? He gave some information that actually was classified. Uh, he said he declassified it there, but he may have compromised the security of our friends, the Israelis. So that's the kind of recklessness, the impetuosity uh, that, that he displays day after day. And virtually, think about this, every person who's ever served with him has come away wanting to write a book on how bad it was. I don't recall that happening with any other president in our history, certainly during my lifetime, I haven't. But there is not a so, person who has served in the White House who doesn't come out and say, my God, if you could only see what's going on behind these closed doors. William Cohen, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense there and founder, chairman, and CEO yeah. of the Cohen Group. Joe, what took me really is actually not so much that the secretary there thinks the issue is a specific incident in the documents, but right. the behavior Absolutely. of the former president. And that is the nuance of this case as we try to delineate between this one and Joe Biden's, of course, very unusual to see the former secretary that passionate about something yeah. we're discussing here. Very concerning. Coming up, Trump, who is making a comeback bid for the White House, of course, as we've been telling you, pled not guilty to 37 charges. We'll have all the latest with a political panel next. From Washington, this is Balance of Power. If this indictment is true, if what it says is actually the case, President Trump was incredibly reckless with our national security. This case is a serious case with serious allegations. But in America, you're still innocent until proven guilty. As a naval officer, if I would have taken classified to my apartment, I would have been court-martialed in a New York minute. And I'm deeply troubled to see this indictment. The unprecedented indictment of a former president of the United States. It's not just a sad day, but it's a troubling day. 
Those are some of the Republican political candidates weighing in on Trump's indictment. For more, let's bring in our political panel, Kevin Sheridan, former senior advisor to the Romney-Ryan campaign and founder of Protean Public Affairs, and Kristen Hahn, Democratic strategist and Rock Solutions partner. Kevin, let's start with you. We're starting to see a little bit more movement from these Republican candidates to start to criticize the indictment itself, talking about the seriousness of it. Um, even though at the same time they are also talking about the weaponization of the DOJ. Mm -hmm. But do you think we'll see more of that, more concerns, Nikki Haley saying it's reckless? Yeah, the door's been cracked open here a little bit, and you're, see, you're starting to see some actual criticism of Trump. They're going to have to pick their spots where they can criticize him, right, and without offending uh, his base too much. But this is one of those times, and they're going to have to see what comes out in the, uh, in the court filings and see how Donald Trump plays this and what he says. Look, all these Republicans are, are going to also say that the polarization or the, uh, you know, the by indicting him, the, the, you're just creating more polarization in this country, and that's just, um, it's not good for our politics, it's not good for anybody. Um, but they've got to pick their spots, and this is one of those spots where they can actually go in hard. Chris Christie has become the face, I guess, of that oh, opposition, yeah. certainly uh, within the presidential uh, campaign field. He held a town hall on CNN last night. Listen to his approach. He has shown himself, and I think most is particularly in his post-presidency, to be completely self-centered, completely self-consumed, and doesn't give a damn about the American people, in my view. But Kristen, will Chris Christie remain the only candidate to talk like that? I think you're seeing a little, like you said, a little bit of a dam break with this type of yeah. thing. Um, I think he probably, I mean, that's that's his personality. No one's even close to that. Nobody's though. even close to that. I mean, that's his personality. He'll, sure. he'll, you know, he'll continue to do that. Um, I would like to see more of the, the candidates on the Republican side coming after Trump. This is a really big deal, what happened today. Yeah, Chris Christie was very direct in his criticism. He said the ego run amok, mm -hmm. vanity run amok. These candidates are clearly convinced, though, that they can't win the nomination if they run counter to the MAGA movement at this period of time. I guess yes. that could change. At some point, though, should we all be looking at them as candidates in their own right instead of candidates in a in versus the former president? Because when everyone talks about them, it's how are they in respect to Trump, not just how yes. are they in their own right. I was actually having this conversation with um, a couple of just even House uh, members of the House. I was like, stop defining yourself as in the context of Donald Trump. Mm. Stop saying MAGA country. Stop saying, I mean, they're, they need to start defining themselves in their own right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's obviously a lot to take from this. Listen to J.D. Vance uh, from earlier today on Capitol Hill, uh, the Republican senator from Ohio, also speaking with Bloomberg News. I think that we have to grind this department to a halt until Merrick Garland promises to do his job and stop going after his political opponents. That was a video that he ended up uh, posting on Twitter for what it's worth. Uh, who's going to strike the right chord here? Somebody's going to have the winning message that everyone else coalesces around. There's a, there's a lot of balloons floating right now. Who, who is actually... Well, there's a direct criticism of Donald Trump yeah. for this, but there's also the bigger issue of the DOJ and the FBI. And those are sweet spots for Republican voters. They want to hear Ron DeSantis is, is right now leaking or, or, or soft rolling out some plans to gut the FBI and gut the DOJ and start over. And, and um, you know, that's going to be music to a lot of Republican voters' mm -hmm. ears because that's what they want to hear. So if you can separate a little bit of the personality of Trump, the wrongdoing of Trump, you know, with this is a bigger issue. This is about the DOJ. This, this is about the Bidens not getting prosecuted for anything. This is about Hillary Clinton getting off for the same crime. Uh, in 2016. So that's where they're going to take this, I think, and that's that's probably the sweet spot for most of them. Uh, the former president is now en route to his home in New Jersey to Bedminster, his golf course there. He's going to be speaking this evening. He's trying to raise $2 million off of this. Anything we can expect out of this evening that we haven't heard before? No, you're going to hear it's stem winder, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, he went to uh, Versailles in Miami and, and met with the Cuban community right after this surprise move. And then he, um, he's going to have a big fundraiser tonight. I think you will hear classic Donald Trump. He will go after, I, you know, it's probably a big mistake. And I don't know who's legally advising him right now because he doesn't seem to have lawyers. But um, so Isn't he... is the whole point? You leave an arraignment and you do not speak? Yeah, you would think Even so. Even O.J. Simpson gave him the advice not to speak publicly about the case. And here we are. The Versailles move, though, was pretty shrewd, was it not? Politically deaf. Could yeah. Ron DeSantis have pulled that off? What do you think, Kristen? I, I don't know about that. I mean, Trump, ha he has a lot of, um, 
He has a lot of fans in a lot of different parts of the state of California. I thought it was a really deft move. And like Kevin said, he's going to, he's probably going to raise a lot of money off of, off of this. His, his rhetoric, though, is dangerous. Um, and, you know, like we said before, the other candidates should be pushing back. He says $2 million tonight. I guess yeah. we'll find out. Coming up with our panel, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's deal with Republican rebels risks a government shutdown. We're back with more on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. a Cubano when you can have cake, I guess. There it is, the former president at Versailles, the iconic Cuban restaurant in Miami, moments after leaving the courthouse, 77 years old, yeah. Anne-Marie. So happy birthday, I guess, to the former president, but that's not, much, not so much the point of us showing you that. It was, it was a bit of, uh, of craftsmanship uh, on the PR scale after yeah, making history as the first former president and to be And that right. clip will be the clip that everyone starts to run and his comments there in front of this really iconic Cuban restaurant yeah. in Miami and not outside of the courthouse, mm -hmm. which was a historic indictment of a former president. I also wonder, Kevin, if that was a move on Ron DeSantis, knowing that he's frequently criticized for not having the retail skills to do something like that. Yeah, this is an easy move for Donald Trump, and um, he's got excellent um, uh, skills on uh, on PR, especially sure. this kind of thing. But look, Don, Ron DeSantis could also do that. He could he could go down there to the Cuban community, and we, we need to see more of that. We need to see him out and, and about and, um, and and having some viral moments like that happen. For well, him. while the political campaigns are going to start to really rev up, and obviously we'll be watching what happens next with the former president's uh, court cases, happening here in Washington is potentially we're closer to government shutdown because of this deal the speaker made with the far right flank of his party. Is that what we're really headed towards? They have this debt ceiling drama now potentially a shutdown? We're going to almost yes. relive it again? Yes. I mean, it's not the, it's not the same thing. You know, a government shutdown is not, not quite defaulting but a on the country step, but it's a standoff. And we saw what happened last week. You have a very few um, number of Republicans who can take down the rule, which allows a bill to come to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and then McCarthy goes back and makes a whole new set of, you know, deals that he's not going to be able to uphold if um, we're actually going to get those appropriations bills, the bills that fund the federal government, off the floor. So this sounds like the end of the McCarthy-Biden honeymoon, if there ever was one here. And if you're playing along on your home game, this, uh, this came about in the last 24 hours with uh, conservative Republicans in the House bringing us back to this idea of going to FY22 levels. That's a more than $100 billion cut from the agreement they just made. Yep. Doesn't stand a chance in the Senate. And the president won't sign it. So what's Kevin McCarthy doing? He's got to appeal to his base. He's got to throw some red meat to them um, just to appeal and to show, I guess, show that he's fighting for, for what they want. They think that they got rolled by the president, um, you know, in the the debt limit debate or the the debt limit agreement. Yes, right. So he's got to so play this song, song and dance. But at the end of the day, that's not going to happen. And they're going to have to come around or you're going to have a situation where, like in the last, in the, the when we raised, we raised the debt limit, yeah. that you had more Democrats voting for it than Republicans. And so to your point, yeah. October 1st, we have a likely shutdown. Yeah, and a standoff. Um, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, says they need to uphold their end of the bargain, the Republicans. The president came out and said he negotiated with McCarthy in good faith. How does this look in terms of Speaker McCarthy in negotiating good faith? If well, now thank God for, for <laughs> Kevin McCarthy, because who else would want this job? <laughs> um, look, he's got, he's got a tough hand to play. He made promises back during the actual votes, the 15-round votes for uh, Speaker in January, and, and um, we don't know exactly what promises were made, what deals were cut then. And, you know, this is a wildly complicated story if you really dive into it, all the personalities and, yes. oh, yeah. and people saying that they're, they've been undercut, they've been lied to. Uh, but look, he do, he's doing a really good job for the, for the position he's in. He's, he has not gotten the uh, vote of no confidence in any way. Nobody's, nobody's even suggesting that yet. Um, he's, you know, legislation is moving again. You know, it stopped for a few days, but now it's, it's back. So 
we'll just see. They've got 12 appropriation bills they've got to get mm -hmm. done, and you know, we'll see if they can they can come to it. 12 yeah. bills and five families. It's like watching The Godfather, <laughs> the five families yeah. in the Republican House. Yeah, well, at least we'll have something to talk about in the upcoming months. <laughs> Our said. thanks to political panel Kevin Sheridan and Kristen Hahn for joining us this evening. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter for these stories and more on the terminal and, of course, online. Thanks a lot for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg.